This week, Angelo sits down with Adelaide indie developer Matt Trobiani, creator of terminal-based hacking simulator Hacknet. And for your slacker fix, Johnny chats to Brian O'Halloran and Marilyn Gigliotti, better known as Dante and Veronica from Clerks. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week we have just a few big announcements to get through. Let's start with the one that rocked the most boats, shall we? Here's a look at Far Cry 5. I know that you were out there. And I know that you were in pain. But my children, I'm here to tell you that suffering is a choice. And you can choose a better path. We want you, we accept you, and we will take you, willingly or not. And some of you may fight, but in the end, you will thank us. I am your father, and you are my children. This time around, Ubisoft has gone for something a little closer to home. Far Cry 5 is set in Montana, USA, home of The Project, a cult-like organization that will do anything it takes to make sure they are in absolute control of their surroundings. Your job is, essentially, to take away that control, and you do that by arresting the leader of the group, a man named Joseph. Things go about as smoothly as you'd expect, and the unfolding open-world experience has already been compared to something from Tarantino. Predictably, in the real world, certain groups of people are already getting a bit upset over Ubisoft's choice of villains. Apparently, white-skinned American Christian bad guys are inappropriate in the current political climate. Far Cry 5 is out February 2018. Squad, the developers of Kerbal Space Program, want to reassure the game's fan base that nothing will really change, despite the massive bombshell news that the game has been purchased by Take-Two Interactive. The news kind of came out of nowhere. Kerbal Space Program launched officially back in April 2015 and has been ticking away gaining a cult following ever since. Now it looks like that following includes someone at Take Two, with the publisher forking over an undisclosed amount of cash for the franchise. Rather than taking too much time off to celebrate, the development team tells fans they're still hard at work on the upcoming Making History expansion, which will provide players with even more ways to send lovable Kerbals into orbit. When Sledgehammer Games announced that Call of Duty World War II would be a historical experience, nobody was really surprised. The development team has spent time wandering around Europe, researching locations and getting a sense of what it would feel like to really be in Normandy at 10 below with snow coming down. They learned about battleground tank modifications and where the weak points are in era-appropriate tank treads. What did surprise us though was the revelation that the upcoming Nazi zombie mode also contains a storyline that is based on real events. I'm sure we'll hear more about that one later on this month at E3. Because of course E3 is coming up altogether far too quickly this year, the Electronic Entertainment Expo hits Los Angeles from June 13 to 15 and we are expecting all sorts of big announcements. Stay tuned to Player Attack for the big ones. With seven big pre-show press conferences this year, we are expecting big stuff from Microsoft, Bethesda, Ubisoft, Sony, and Nintendo. The PC gaming show should also feature some interesting bits and pieces, and while EA will not be part of E3 itself, the publisher has some big announcements scheduled for June 11, so it won't miss out on the spotlight. And one of the games we are sure will take center stage at EA's event is the new Need for Speed, with Payback announced this week. If you're expecting anything other than cars, casinos, criminals, and cops, you will be sadly disappointed. Hey, Matt. You built this all yourself? <laughs> An artist can turn any scrap into a supercar. This crew right here, that's the future. We own these streets, Tyler, and the house always wins. Now in quick news, we are still left in the dark when it comes to Detroit Become Human, but Quantic Dream did emerge from their cave this week to reveal that Heavy Rain has now sold more than 4.5 million copies worldwide. First released back in 2010, Heavy Rain enjoyed a resurgent when it hit PS4 last year. And then while it wasn't perfect, this game was the reason I bought a PS3, so on a personal level, I'm very happy to see it's still kicking on. 
Meanwhile, speaking of that particular console, it is the end of an era as Japan officially ceases production of the 500GB standard model PS3. The console has been on sale for nearly 11 years and, it seems, has come to the end of its run. Bohemia Interactive has been quietly slugging away on tactical first-person multiplayer shooter Argo for a while now. The game features a variety of game modes, leaderboards, an impressive unlock system for weapons and gear, and the ability to create and edit your own scenarios that can play out over the massive 62 square kilometer island of Malden. And it'll be out from June 22, and it'll be free, with no microtransactions. Not quite free, but the next big thing, Sonic Mania will cost just 20 bucks in the US when it launches on August 15. The dreaded Australia tax probably means it'll be closer to 50 bucks in Australia, and the collector's edition is still pretty pricey, but the standard version at least should cost less than you would expect. If you are hanging out for Middle Earth Shadow of War, the sequel to the ridiculously popular Shadow of Mordor, you will be hanging out a while longer. Warner Brothers has officially pushed the game back by just a little bit, so it will be on shelves from October 10th this year. Originally planned for an August release, Monolith Productions explains the delay is, you guessed it, because the team wants to deliver the highest quality experience and they don't want to rush things. If you're hanging out for a new smartphone or a new Nintendo Switch, you might have to choose which one is more important to you. Turns out there is an international industry-wide shortage for components that are used in smartphones, computer servers and game consoles. That is, things like NAND flash memory chips, liquid crystal displays and the tiny motors that make your controller feel like there's an ice cube clinking in a glass. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, we've got plenty more still to come. So Matt uh, is the developer of Hacknet and uh, the recently released uh, Hacknet Liber Labyrinths, yep. your expansion and stuff. Yep. So yeah, can you walk us through a little bit about what Hacknet is really? Yeah, sure. So it's like a, a terminal driven hacking simulator game that's meant to be so realistic you can't play it in an airport. Uh, not that I haven't done a whole bunch of like development on planes and in airports before. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's designed to just be like super immersive, super realistic, uses like mostly real terminal commands, um, like correct port numbers and like uh, lots of like theory from uh, like computer security itself. But basically whenever you're like making a game about hacking, you have to like draw a line somewhere, right? So on this end, you've got like the, the tube game from Bioshock, which is yeah. not very realistic. Yeah. And on this game, you've got uh, what we call the internet, which is a game that already exists, right? Um, so you've got to like pick your point of realism from like not real to completely real, which is still like sort of a game to a whole bunch of people, but like you've got to pick your point in that line. So I tried to pick the point that would require you not to have a computer science degree. And it would cut out a bunch of like boring stuff, right? So it's mostly chasing after like the the feel and uh, like the the ideas and the style of thinking and like investigating that you want to do when you're like looking to break into something. Um, and I've got really good responses from like how well that's gone. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. But Absolutely. Yeah, that's what Hacknet's about. So um, the game also has a set story to it as well. Like mm -hmm. you basically you, you start sort of hacking, you know, these smaller terminals and things, and then you sort of unravel sort of like a deeper mystery involved with someone mm -hmm. who's already died, um, and you know they've left messages for you to follow, like breadcrumbs and things like that. So how did yep. you come up with that? I mean, it's, it sounds like a sort of like the whole ghost in the box thing, you know? How, yeah. You know, you, you get this thing, and then there's some, there's something sort of possessing it and talking to you. Yeah. Through, like you know, so so how did you come up with that sort of concept? Uh, I actually can't even remember at this point. It's like that was a really long time ago. Yep. Um, it's not like the whole story just came out at once. Like I had a couple of bits and pieces that were like floating around in my head, and then I made them slowly over time. And then once those bits were made. Like I saw like holes and then I patched them and um, like rounded out like over a long period of time. Like I'd written the uh, the beginning like a really long time ago, being like I know that I want to start the game with a message from someone that's dead, um, and they're going to be uh, like the person that will help guide you through the start and get you set up. Uh, and I knew that's the way I wanted to make it, but I hadn't really sorted out like the ending and um, 
like some other details of the story until like really late in development. Um, so it kept like changing over time. But uh, <laughs> it's like a it's like a really weird question, right? Like, how did you come up with the story? It's like yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I was just sort of making stuff up. Well, so so, so like... it's, it's not something that you like you were inspired by, but you you know say hackers for example, that mm. like nothing from that sort of called in. It was like, oh, I'd like to do a game about hacking or anything. Like, how did how did you marry something like a, a story about someone who's dead with it? You know, and there's a conspiracy surrounding that to mm. game elements where you're hacking. Um, like, so what was the connection? Yeah, so this is... I, I don't want to like just pin the responsibility on this because I'm not actually sure where it came from, but um, like uh, setting up these dead man switches is something that I've talked about with a bunch of like people in the computer science degree before. Just because like in that sort of environment, those sort of people are like... It's really fun to talk about like covering every possible case, including cases in which you die like halfway through your work, right? So... Um, we talk about like setting up dead man switches, and um, a dead man switch is a like a, a thing that you, a button that you have to keep pressing basically. And if you don't press it for, like a certain amount of time, it assumes that you can't press it because you're dead, and then it sends out a bunch of like things. Yep. So um, that's basically like what triggers at the start of uh, Hacknet. And then yeah, so like that was something that I thought was like really fascinating. It's like a concept. Like like what would you put in your message? Like what's like so important to you and what are you like working on and like what would you say like what do you need to say like why would you make one of those and there are some pretty valid reasons for that um and exploring those options was like really interesting so um that was like a big inspiration for it all mm. yeah um so then when did the development on um labyrinth start like did that start pretty much immediately afterwards or were you busy patching the original game and then you moved over to labyrinth? yeah yeah so um see I, I had no idea if this was like a good amount of stuff to have done by the like one year after it's launched. Yep. Um, but there's like a lot of stuff to do. Um, like when you put out a video game, like yeah. I was going like all over the place for different conventions. Um, put out like 50 updates or something, like mostly for bug fixes, but with, like some small feature changes and improvements and things. Um, that was over like the first year, and then um, uh, what was it? Yeah, a, a couple of months after that, I think. A month or two after that, I started work on Labyrinths. Hey there everybody, I am Johnny at Oz Comic Con and we found ourselves a very, very fitting wall to hang out and just rap about collects. Salsa Shark. We're gonna need a bigger boat. Throughout history, they have been a part of our American life. Men and women who have made it their mission to serve their fellow man. They've worked hard enough. Isn't it time? They had their own movie. Clerks. Guys, possibly the most seminal indie budget film I grew up watching. How did it feel to be in something, did it feel at the time like it was going to be huge, basically? I, I, one thing that I always say, you can't know, unless you're some kind of a superhero movie and stuff like that, but I think the ride was pretty nice though, of, of how it came about and all. You know, it was pretty much all, all of our first efforts involved in, in independent filmmaking, so uh, we didn't know where it would go. I mean, to be honest with you, towards the end, it was almost like, well, this could be something that I'd have on a VHS tape to show my mates. Kids, ask your grandparents what VHS tapes were. And so, you know, that type of thing. So I never thought it would be something that would, that would resonate so well with the Generation X culture that we were. I caught the tail end of it because I'm a, a young lad. Right. And I came across it in a movie store one day on VHS. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Sat down, I'm like, these bunch of Americans, pretty funny. How much of the influence of the script was Kevin's, and how much did you guys bring to the characters as well? Oh, it was all, it was all Kevin. Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah, it, the writing is pretty much ninety-eight percent Kevin, and we are uh, probably about you know our inflection and stuff like that. Our take on the character is all us, but for the most part, all the dialogue is all him, and that's the genius about him. What did you like better, Jedi or The Empire Strikes Back? Empire, blasphemy. Empire had the better ending. I mean. Luke gets his hand cut off, finds out Vader's his father, a uh, hand gets frozen, take away by Boba Fett, it ends on such a down note. I mean, that's what life is, a series of down endings. All Jedi had was a bunch of Muppets. I've talked to a couple of people that live stateside, and they always bring it up as this gem of New Jerseyness. 
back how it was. Is that what you guys feel is? I mean, uh, when, when you travel a lot around the States, you can see how specifically Jersey, a lot of the dialogue, let's say, and even the attitude is. But in the end, it is a slice of life pretty much anywhere who's, who's ever worked that type of convenience store or retail store type of clerk anywhere. If you're wearing a name badge, you're a clerk of some sort. So it, it doesn't even matter if you're a nurse. You're a nurse in a hospital, you're clerking to patients. And there are patients that are pain in the ass, just like there are people in stores who are pains in the ass. Everybody that comes in here is way too uptight. This job would be great if it wasn't for the fucking customers. Jesus, I'm gonna hear from the boss tomorrow. Oh, would you loosen up? You'd feel a hell of a lot better if you'd just rip into the occasional customer. Why? I, I don't bother them and they don't bother me. A liar. Tell me there aren't customers that annoy the piss out of you on a daily basis. There aren't. Why can you lie like that? Why don't you vent? Vent your frustrations. Come on, who pisses you off? Well, uh, I guess it isn't customers in particular. Maybe just a group of customers. Well, let's hear it. Well, the milkmaids. The milkmaids? The women that go through every gallon of milk looking for that later date, as if somewhere beyond all the other gallons is a container of milk that won't go bad for like a decade. I think that's why it is so well liked, because it's just so relevant. And it's like, who hasn't worked in a service industry job? <laughs> or been in an establishment where you were treated like crap and like, what are these kids doing back there? Where the hell is my sandwich? You know, it's the same thing. It's one of those things as well. Everything about the movie screams wonderfully budget but at the same time it all comes together to work so perfectly how do you think they actually pulled off <sighs> well you know the, the fact that it, it's it all comes back to his writing again he, the fact that he can put in these pieces of his everyday work a day jobs life stuff along with what is going on in their own lives like you know, he's having issues with his girlfriend. The ex-girlfriend is coming back into the picture. His friends are bothering because, hey, man, we scheduled a hockey game. I don't care if you have work. We're playing no matter what. So I think all those type of ideals and jokes actually really went well in the sense of how it connected with other people. You know, it's a very mature male, immature, sophomoric type of humor. But in the end, I think everybody kind of enjoyed it at the end. I, I think it's, it's nice, though, that the fact that because most of the time, let's face it, it's so many movies that's like that's so male oriented. But at least you know he's able to write, write women well as well. It's one of those things as well. It's like the movie has created endearing characters now span the viewers universe, right. and to see everybody just come together in two again and the relationship just carry on. Did you guys predict that that would even happen? Oh no, not at all. I mean, we were just hoping that people would just enjoy the movie, not latch on to certain characters and really want to see more of it. But also, Kevin enjoyed writing for these characters, so we popped up in many other films as well as the cartoon series we did back in 2000. So these are Kevin's beloved children for all of eternity. These will be the, the kids besides his own, obviously, real child, Harley Quinn. Um, these are the characters that he loves going back to again and again. And that's why we're going to be going back to a, uh, a Jay and Silent Bob movie he's planning to shoot. Uh, hopefully by August we can start shooting that. He says we, but I have no idea whether I'll be involved in that. We haven't seen the script, so we don't know. That. Yeah, um, but I was supposed to be involved in Clerks 3, so, but unfortunately we all know the story to that. That uh, it was heartbreaking, but, you know, out of people's control. You know who I can do without? I can do without the people in the video store. Which ones? All of them. What would you get for a six-year-old boy who chronically wets his bed? So do you have any new movies in? Do you have that one with that guy who was in that movie that was out last year? Noise, noise, noise. Smoking weed, smoking weed. Doing coke, drinking beers. Pack our ass, my good man. Time to kick back, drink some beers, and smoke some weed. With Kev now going back to that real grassroots independent filmmaking with um, Task, Task as fantastic, you've got, do you think that that can create an inspiration for a whole new model of filmmakers to come out, especially with YouTube and all these new things at their fingertips? It's up to them. I mean, the technology and the outlets are there for young filmmakers to make their own films. Uh, sometimes the, the ease and access of technology and able to post it anywhere 
has made it where there's so much content that you don't know where to find the really good stuff. And I think that's where film festivals come into play, where if you go to your local film festivals, support your local film festivals, you'll be able to see some really adventurous work that's being produced today. I think that's something, though, that's always been around. It's like there, there are those people who are creative and getting out their, their own way of, uh, and style of filming, and it's just a matter of finding them. So basically troll your local theaters, your local everywhere, just looking for people that can fill this, the void you need. Or, or make your own. If, you want, if there are stories that are not being told out there that you're like, I'd love to hear a story about such and such, do it. Find other like-minded people who are in, who want, you know, people who want to be actors, people who want to do lighting, people who want to run a camera, and put it together and make a, a, a movie or make a TV show or make whatever it is that you enjoy talking or, or expressing yourself about. You definitely are the source in this area, and we're going to shut you down for good. For good. Cancer merchant. Cancer merchant. Cancer merchant. Who's leading this mob? <laughs> that guy. Freeze. What's going on? Let's see some credentials. Slowly. You're a Chulis gum representative? Chulis? And that you're stirring up all this anti-smoking sentiment. To what? Sell more gum? Get out of here. And you people, don't you have jobs to go to? Get out of here. Go commute. You gotta be ashamed of yourselves. A bunch of easily led automatons. Try thinking for yourselves before you pelt an innocent man with cigarette. You guys talked about Clerks 3, obviously, not coming through, which is a big shame. But I feel there's that void that it could totally get right now with the new disenfranchisement we have amongst the youth that were the original Clerks audience, so... Right. I mean, the original perspective of the original Clerks was the overeducated, underemployed. And boy, are we so underemployed right now, and still overeducated in some sense. But then there's also a mass of undereducated, underemployed as well, thus dictating politics lately. Um, so it's nice to see that, you know, those type of... that type of... Influence on film, yes, can be. This could be influential yet again. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully is a good answer. Every time I kiss you, I'm gonna taste 36 other guys. I'm going to school. Maybe later you'll be a bit more rational. I'm 37. I just. Goodbye, can't be... Dante. Hey, try not to suck any dick on the way through the parking lot. Hey, hey, you get back here. But now, again, there's just so much. Like, what what's on the horizons other than? Um, Jane Silent Bob strike for a thrice time now. <laughs> well, for me, um, I actually just auditioned for a pilot in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So I'll see what happens with that. I really can't say much more than that. Um, and then I've got a feature film that I'm going to be shooting in uh, upstate New York called Murder Hill, along with Tom Proctor, James Russo, and Basil Hoffman. So very looking forward to that. And uh, auditioning, just auditioning. <laughs> uh, a couple of months ago in, in uh, England, I was working on Jason Mew's first film that he's directing called Madness and the Method. Uh, so look for that probably by this fall. It has uh, cameos with uh, Stan Lee and Danny Trejo and Kevin Smith and many, many more. So that's going to be a very funny film to see come out. Um, working with Jay and Bob, Kevin's asked me to be a part of that. And then I have uh, two other films that I'm in the talks with right now, hopefully. Uh, and another one that's in post called Hindsight 2020. So we got a few things going on, and um, I'll be doing a couple of more cons in the States. So we'll see what happens. Sounds like fun times for everybody then. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for hanging out against this wonderful wall with us. And I hope you have a great time for the rest of the con. Look for this great soundtrack. And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, E3 hits Los Angeles. The highlight of the gaming calendar, it's the biggest event of the year and an absolute case of sensory overload. We'll pick out the best bits for you, the best reveals, the killer trailers and the announcements we did not expect. 
In the meantime, you can catch us at playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Also, if you want to support Player Attack, you can find us on Patreon and help us bring you the latest in gaming news, plus all these wonderful interviews and reviews from the world of video games. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.